Hi everyone, welcome to a, another video on the history of medicine. And starting you off with a very famous phrase, ladies and gentlemen, to do with doctors. Hello, I'm a doctor, I do very important work. Well, what does a doctor do? Well, he or she cures patients when they're ill. But they also try to prevent the patient getting ill in the first place. It's an old saying, prevention is better than cure. Because if you prevent them, they don't actually, the patient doesn't suffer all the terrible symptoms of a certain disease before they can be cured. Prevention is better than cure. And this video, ladies and gentlemen, is all about prevention, progress made in areas of prevention in medicine in the second half of the 20th century, 1950, right the way to present day. Now, if we go back into history, think of some of the videos that we've already hopefully had a look at. We know that many people died very young. Life expectancy was very low. And the reason for that, one of the reasons for that, was that we could not cure infectious diseases or we could not stop people from getting infectious diseases. Even in 1911, just over 100 years ago, and 1911, 50 years after Louis Pasteur's germ theory, so we'd known about germs for 50 years, 1911, 25% of the people who died, the death rate, 25% was due to infectious diseases, for example, TB or tuberculosis. So that shows that it was still quite a big problem. Today, that percentage has drastically reduced down to below 1%. Today, we live longer. We now tend to die, not so much from infectious diseases, we tend now to be, uh, we end our lives through more diseases which are associated with old age, for example, for example cancers or some heart disease. So we've obviously succeeded in preventing infectious diseases. Prevention is better than cure. Three main reasons for this. Number one, we've looked at this before. It's just a little quick bit of revision for you. I give you vaccinations. Ladies and gentlemen, quick question. Who invented the first or discovered the first vaccination? Come on, move along there. Let's get the answer. Bonus points for anyone who said Edward Jenner way back in 1796 do you remember cowpox smallpox hopefully you do if not go and have a look at that video so vaccination started towards 1800 then as pasteur and cock came along there was some improvement through the 1860s the 1870s and the 1880s even though we moved into the 20th century moved into the 20th century sorry 1913 a disease called diphtheria hmm. we get the vaccination in 1913 good news you would say of course but here's a statistic for you 1940 there are 60,000 cases of diphtheria a year and there are 3,000 deaths how could that be? Any ideas? We've got the vaccination. 3,000 die. What do you think? Well, not everybody wanted the vaccination. So the government starts campaigning. I'll come back to that word later in this video. Using the radio, newspapers, using schools to get the message across. Get the vaccination. Protect yourself. Prevent somebody from getting the disease. As a result of the campaign, remember 1940, 3,000 deaths. 1957, six deaths. 1940, 60,000 cases of diphtheria. 1957, 38 cases. What does that tell you about the efficiency 
and success of vaccinations, but the government has to persuade people to do that. Now, in one of my previous videos, I was looking at technology and I mentioned the electron microscope, 1931 it was developed, and 1946, the electron microscope was used to isolate and identify the germ or microbe that caused a terrible disease called polio. 1946, we finally isolated, that's the disease. Eight years later, 1954, an American scientist, Jonas Salk, S-A-L-K, he comes up with the vaccination against polio. He will prevent, this will prevent polio. Great news, you would say. 1954. Throughout that time, 1947 through to 1958, there were various polio epidemics, outbreaks of the disease. 30,000 children got polio. Again, we see a vaccination campaign to persuade people to have the vaccination, to prevent the disease. At the time, a professional footballer played for Birmingham City called Jeff Hall, a very fit athlete. He got polio and sadly died. That acted as a bit of a wake-up call, ladies and gentlemen. My gosh, we need to protect ourselves. Nowadays, thanks to the vaccinations, polio, we get about two cases a year. It's virtually been wiped out. So you can see vaccinations, the diphtheria, the polio, and here's a final one for you. 1964, I was three years old when we had, for the first time, the measles vaccination. Measles can be a serious disease. It can result in death and it can cause eye problems and hearing problems. And even if you got a milder form, you'd be off school for weeks. So measles, measles was a problem. 64, we get the vaccination, and again, the number of people, particularly children, suffering from the disease declines. So that's your first effort, your first success in preventing disease, vaccinations. Second one, I've mentioned it in some of the other videos, the developments in DNA. Can you remember any of the people involved in that? Well, hopefully. Rosalind Franklin, Watkins, Crick, Watson. Once we've got DNA, it leads to genetic screening and we can now identify possible diseases that a patient might get in the future. And then we can set some uh, action up to prevent that taking place. The second one, the development of DNA, vaccinations, DNA. The third one, and quite an unusual one, but it's still very, very important for us, ladies and gentlemen. And it's to do with our lifestyle. Now, if you go back into the 1800s, the government refused to get involved in people's lives. Not our responsibility. It was called laissez-faire. And when some people said, look, the streets of the cities are filthy. We're going to set up a clean party. Some members of Parliament then set up a dirty party. Look, it's nothing to do with us. We want to be dirty. Let it happen. But now we have a difference in attitude. Now we have a government which says, look, we need to get involved. The complete opposite of laissez-faire. Starts, of course, with 1948, the setting up of the NHS. As I said before, 8 million new people were treated for the first time. At first, they had to try and treat them because they already had the diseases because they'd never been to the doctors or they'd never been able to afford the medicine. But once they'd been treated, the government quickly realised it was far better to try and prevent them from getting ill in the first place. Prevention is better than cure, as I said. So they set up more government campaigns. Now, we live in a world of advertising. Companies spend millions and millions of pounds every year to try and persuade us to buy their stuff, whether it's clothing, whether it's food, sweets, 
drinks, makeup, it doesn't really matter. They persuade us. Advertising campaigns work. Otherwise, they wouldn't do it. And the government says, we are going to have to campaign as well. Now, they can do it in a variety of ways. The first thing they could do is actually pass laws. And back in 1952, because there were so many coal fires then, particularly in the big cities, for example, London, there was something called the Great Smog. Terrible, terrible conditions to breathe in. And there were 4,000 deaths in London because of the air pollution. Well, 1952, the Great Smog. It reminds me of way back 1858, the Great Stink, when it was very hot summer and the River Thames, the water went down and all the terrible smells. Sometimes history repeats itself, ladies and gentlemen. But 1952, the government are now saying, we need to do something because so many people were suffering from asthma and bronchitis, things to do with the chest and breathing. So they introduced in 1956 the Clean Air Act, an example of the government trying to prevent disease by acting. Now, what else? Well, it's very important and it's become more and more important as time has gone on. Diet. Now, here's one of my favourite books, Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. And for those of you who don't or might not know the story, in Oliver Twist, what we get is a young boy and he ends up in the workhouse in a very, very poor part of London and he's not fed very much. And he's, he's had his meal and they say to him, right, you better go and ask. And he goes up with his bowl. He says, please, sir, can I have some more? Because he wasn't getting enough food. Oliver. And those of you, you may have seen, uh, the, there's a musical. Oliver, Oliver, never before has a boy wanted more. Oliver, Oliver. And another one, food, glorious food. Well, here's an Oliver and food, glorious food. Jamie Oliver. You may have heard of him. For those of you who haven't, he's a chef. And he's helped the government to run campaigns to get children, particularly in schools, to eat more healthily. There's something a few years ago called the Eat Well Plate. It was a drawing of a plate. And on it, it said, right, have this, have your fruits, have your vegetables, have your carbohydrates, have your uh, meat or fish or whatever. And there's campaigns where it said you should have five pieces of fruit a day. Fruit and vegetable, five a day. The five a day. Look at that. Hey, I've got two. I can actually juggle with three. But I've had one just before we did the video. I'm trying to be healthy. So diet was an important part of the government's campaign. The eat well plate, five a day. Jamie Oliver and other chefs trying to get us healthier hearts. So that as we all get older, because we're not dying from the infectious disease, our hearts will carry us through. We're not going to have heart attacks because we're eating unhealthily. Another example of the government getting involved, particularly with schools. Linked in the lifestyle to diet, of course, is exercise. Now, over the past 10, 20, 30 years, running has become far more popular. People run the marathon. OK, now I don't run a marathon, but I do have a pair of trainers and I do things shorter distances, half a marathon or, for example, 10 kilometers. Here's one that I did earlier this year, the 10K, 10 kilometer run. Now, I'm an old man, so as I was coming down the finishing straight, I was overtaken by a snail, a tortoise, and a man in a rhino suit. It doesn't matter. I was trying to do some exercise, and the governments have encouraged this. They have races. They have clubs where you can go and run. Lifestyle, diet, exercise. 
sometimes on television they had something called the change for life campaign to try and encourage everybody including children to do more exercise because as a country we've got more obese as time has gone on there's a variety of reasons for that but it is not healthy and the government is now saying we will get involved they've introduced another campaign it's called drink aware campaign because of the impact of alcohol on our health particularly our liver and cirrhosis it's rising the amount of illness that alcohol has caused so the government is trying to get involved in the 1980s there was a new disease emerge HIV positive and AIDS and the government spent a lot of money and a leaflet came through the letterbox of every house explaining about AIDS and it said AIDS don't die of ignorance and there were uh, adverts on the telly here's the government again getting involved in our lives to do with health sometimes when we're at work health and safety is now set up to uh, make sure that workers work in a, a safe environment and for example asbestos you cannot live and work where there is asbestos and we have environmental health officers we have food safety hygiene you might go into restaurants or cafes and you'll see a number between naught and five for the hygiene of the food and that was because uh, there were more outbreaks of diseases like E. coli and salmonella through eating infected food so what I've tried to show you ladies and gentlemen is that as the 20th century has gone on we've tried as much as possible to prevent rather than cure illness there's still work to do of course and I've missed out one major area where the government has tried to get involved and that is smoking and that will be on the next video so hope it's been useful I'm off to have some fruit all the best now speak to you soon